All right. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever in the world you're joining us for the next installment of Tiny ML Talks. Uh, wish, uh, wishing everyone a happy, healthy, and prosperous New Year 2022. And for the first talk of this new year, we have Cedric Nutrin from Plumerai, uh, who's going to be talking about demoing the world's fastest inference engine for ARM Cortex M. I'm Ravi Sivalingam from Qualcomm AI Research, and I'll be moderating today's talk. We'd like to thank all our Dynamal Talk strategic partners Aeon Devices, ARM, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Emza Visual Sense, Greenwaves Technologies, Gravity Inc., HOTG, Image Bob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, Kixo, Qualcomm, Reality AI, Renaissance, Rixen Technology, SAP. Seed Studio, Sensimil, Stream Analyze, ST Micro, Sensense, Sentient, and one of our latest sponsors, Clickatech. Uh, additional sponsorships are available. Please contact Olga at tinyml.org for more info. Uh, just a reminder of our upcoming event, TinyML Summit 2022 is going to be in person at the Hyatt Regency San Francisco Airport. Uh, from March 28 to 30 of this year. Registration uh, will, was opened on December 15th and uh, poster submissions have been closed. The Dynamal Research Symposium is on March 28th. Uh, most sponsor sponsorships are available for this event. Please contact sponsorships at dynamal.org. Our next TinyML talk is on Tuesday, January 11th by Tim Callahan, staff software engineer at Google. He's going to be talking about CFU Playground, customize your ML processor for your specific TinyML model at the same time, 8 a.m. Pacific. Please contact talks at tinyml.org if you're interested in presenting at an upcoming event. All right, so Cedric Nufran is a software engineer focused on writing efficient code for deep learning applications. After he received his MSc and PhD from Eindhoven University of Technology, he optimized GPU and CPU code for various companies using C++, OpenCL, and CUDA. Then he worked for four years on deep learning for autonomous driving at TomTom, after which he joined Plumerai, where he is now writing fast code for the smallest microcontrollers. Take it away, Cedric. Thank you and uh, welcome to demoing the world's fastest inference engine for cart ARM Cortex-M microcontrollers. My name is Cédric Nuchtere and I'm with Plumerai. And you might know us from our work on binarized neural networks. So we gave an earlier TinyML talk where we explained how we train binarized neural networks or BNNs. Um, we showcased our LARC ecosystem uh, we explained how these binarized convolutions can lead to really efficient, fast code on uh, tiny devices, but also how going to one bit activations and weights uh, will lead to much smaller models that can actually run on these devices. But you might also know us from our other work on uh, applications such as person detection. Uh, in an earlier tiny ML talk, which is also still available on YouTube, um, we presented person presence detection, where the question is, uh, given an, a video frame, is there a person or no person in, in, the, in the frame? And we tested this on various devices where we can run uh, really efficiently even on these uh, tiny devices. And an example application of this would be uh, to get a push notification uh, on your smart, uh, smart door. And if you think like, seven milliseconds latency, that's, that's way too fast, uh, way too high frame rate. Uh, you, you have to imagine that you might, because it's so efficient, you can now run other applications next to it, or you can go to smaller uh, devices or save energy. And we also worked on uh, more um, uh, complex applications, such as uh, person uh, detection, where you actually have to draw bounding boxes around uh, people for example, to count uh, people in an in office setting or to, um, to find where people are, uh, if they're moving or not. And an example application could be smart offices for, uh, for heat uh, and environmental control. 
Uh, also, this we run uh, with uh, incredible accuracy at, at uh, on, on very small devices, uh, still with good latency and RAM usage numbers. And we have two uh, example videos here of uh, such a, a neural network, binarized neural network, running on a on a small uh, Cortex M, uh, M microcontroller. But that is not the topic of today's talk. Um, and neither is uh, other work of, oh, um, for which you might know Plumerai, which is our work on, uh, on developing our own hardware IP core, uh, which we uh, showcased on FPGAs and, and published a blog post about uh, quite recently. Um, but you might also know us already from the world's, world's fastest uh, Cortex-M inference engine uh, for microcontrollers. And uh, this is a blog post that we published a few months ago. Um, and that's the topic of today's talk. So I would like to give a small uh, overview of the contents of today's talk. So first I'll uh, explain what an inference engine is. Then I'll have a closer look at this table that we presented uh, in the blog post where we showed that we have really efficient uh, a really efficient inference engine for 8-bit uh, integer models. So I want to dig a bit deeper there and also show other benchmarks for other models. Then I will give a li live demo of our public benchmarking service. And finally, I will um, go in more technical details and highlight two, uh, two uh, things that we did to make our inference engine so efficient. But before we do that, maybe it's good to take one step back and, uh, and look a bit at the history of how we got to this point. So here's a timeline of the Plumerai company um, and in the, for the purpose of this topic. And in the early days of the company, uh, we said that our goal was to run complex computer vision tasks on tiny devices efficiently. And we realized quite soon after that in order to do this, you need to cover the entire stack for high efficiency, right? It is not sufficient just to get uh, binarized neural networks. You need to also have an inference stack that supports them efficiently on your target devices. You might even want your own hardware to make it run even more efficiently. Uh, and you might need your own data pipeline to train your models in, uh, in the settings that you want to deploy them with the right cameras, with the right uh, environment. Uh, so we actually started to cover the entire uh, stack. And part of that is the, is the inference stack. And we focused on binarized neural networks because that is uh, what our models um, look like mostly. However, these binarized neural networks do not only have binarized layers but they also have 8-bit integer layers, the more conventional int 8 layers that you, uh, that you will use on such devices. So we also started optimizing those. That led to faster models and models that use less memory, uh, lower RAM usage. And because of that, it means that today we now have the world's fastest inference engine. And this is quite important uh, because a fast inference engine means you might be able to make your models bigger to get better accuracy or your energy usage will go down or you can target smaller devices that are also cheaper typically, or you might have more room for other applications. So let's talk a little bit about what an inference engine is. Um, and to do that, I want to take one step back and look at the whole uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, flow. And typically you start with picking some model, maybe from the internet, or maybe you, you train your own model on your own data and you test things like accuracy and, uh, and you do a lot of training runs. And at some point you're satisfied with your accuracy and you want to use your trained model and deploy it in the field. Um, so then you convert your model and you deploy it on some device. And typically you quantize your, uh, your, your model to 8-bit integer precision, or you might go lower uh, with, with binarized neural networks. But typically this is 8-bit uh, integer, which, which fits these devices much better and comes with almost no accuracy cost. 
And on such a device where you then run your model, you actually hope that the that the that the code that executes your your individual layers uh, is very efficient and really targeted at this device. So that's where the inference engine is, right? There's nothing to do with training. It's just there to run this forward pass inference uh, on your target platform. I identified three main tasks of such an inference engine. And the first task is to execute the layers of a model in the correct order. And uh, here I show on the left an example graph with different activations in between and different connect, uh, ways these, these um, different layers are connected to each other. And it's a task of the inference engine to make sure they're executed in the right order with the right inputs and weights and so on. The second task of an inference engine is to make sure that all these, these inputs and outputs, which we call activations, and, and the weights um, are somewhere stored in memory in an efficient way. And efficient here means that we don't use too much memory, uh, but it might also mean that, that uh, certain locations make it faster or slower, depending on your target device. Um, so that's the second task. It needs to place all these activations, all these weights somewhere in memory. The third task and last task of an inference engine is to provide optimized code for all these individual layer types. Right in the example here on the left, you see a conf2d layer and you see an add layer, and maybe there's a value there as well. Uh, but in reality, there are many different kinds of layers, and each of those layers, uh, we have an inference engine needs to uh, implement, uh, ideally in an efficient way for your target device. So to make this a little bit more concrete, I took uh, an example inference engine which is TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, or TFLM. Um, and we identified these three tasks. So the first task of executing the graph in the right order is what they call the interpreter. The second task of planning these activations and weights is what they call the memory planner. And this is all built into the TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers code. And then the third task, all these efficient uh, implementations of, of all these different layers, is actually sort of outsourced to another library, which is CMSYSNN. And this library is developed by uh, ARM software engineers. And it's therefore a very smart choice because it uh, targets uh, ARM uh, Cortex-M devices as well. Um, so you would expect that that code is, is highly optimized for those devices. So in reality, it, it's slightly more complicated because there is also some optimized code uh, inside TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, but the majority of the important layers like convolution and fully connected and pooling layers are in this CMSYS and library. So these three things together is what we call uh, the TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers inference engine. So net, now let's talk a little bit about our inference engine. Um, and have another look at this blog post that we published uh, three months ago or so. So in that blog post, we published this table um, where we uh, benchmark different uh, inference engines and we, re we report two things. First, we report inference time. So this is the time it takes uh, to run one forward pass of your network, right? Given one input image, for example, uh, how long does it take to produce one output? Um, and secondly, we measure the, the memory usage or the peak memory usage, the RAM usage that is needed to fit this on a device. So if you're beyond this, this uh, uh, the limit, then it won't fit anymore in your device or you have no room for your other applications. So in this um, table, we tested this mobile net V2 network. And this is a very uh, widely used network for computer vision tasks. And we tested this on an M7, uh, Cortex M7 microcontroller. And we mainly looked at the uh, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers as a main uh, benchmark, uh, because that is what most people uh, are likely to be using. Uh, and we compare our inference engine 
to to that one and we see that we're around 40 percent or 50 percent uh better in terms of latency so inference time and ram usage so that's quite an a, a big uh, jump it's not a small uh, improvement uh, and even if we compare it to some of the others uh, that we could find we try to benchmark as many other inference engines as we could uh, get working uh, even compared to those we are significantly uh, more efficient and let me stress this point a bit uh, there are no tricks involved here right so that's not that we do extra quantization or binarization or we prune things or we do sparsity or something like that these are just the exact same networks that are executing uh, on the same devices uh, but just with a different inference engine so they lead to the same accuracy numbers they still produce the same results now you might say okay this table is maybe a bit cherry-picked because it just shows one uh, one model MomoNet v2 so um, what we did to to counter that question is uh, we went online and we searched for other models that we could find that are just publicly available and we try to collect as many as possible so here you see some example sources of where we found those all kind of different uh, model zoos and so on uh, and uh, we downloaded all the models that that are targeted for cortex m microcontrollers uh, and that work with tensorflow light for microcontrollers and uh, we downloaded around 40 or so of them and just run them out of the box on our inference engine uh, but also on uh, TF Lite for microcontrollers for comparison. Now here are uh, the results. So here on the um, x-axis you see all those 40 or so models and uh, you see two graphs. The top graph shows uh, speed up of our inference engine compared to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers and the bottom one shows the RAM reduction factor. So the amount of memory that we save compared to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. And anything above this orange 1.x uh, line means that uh, Plumerize Inference Engine uh, outperforms uh, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. And there are just a few cases here where we are slightly below, but we make up for that in, in, uh, in the other metric. And actually, on, on average, these speedups and RAM reduction factors are quite impressive, 60 and 42%. Uh, in some cases, we even make uh, the code run around a factor two faster uh, than with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, and we save save two or three times uh, the memory. So this is for um, Cortex M4, um, and we have a similar graph for Cortex M7. Uh, results are almost uh, the same as before. Now, you might not be able to read all those model names, so I will also like to mention uh, a few, uh, just to indicate that, uh, that we do cover a wide range of models here. There's a YOLO, for example, there's an uh, RNN network, there's uh, MobileNet V1 and V2, um, there's uh, SqueezeNet um, and, and, uh, and many others that are, uh, that are important. Um, and I want to stress again here that we just change uh, the latency and the memory requirements. We don't change accuracy of these models. Now I want to look, uh, highlight four of those models uh, in a separate slide here, um, because these models are uh, the four models from the official MLPerf tiny benchmark suite. So these are meant to be uh, models that are good fit to evaluate your uh, inference engine and here instead of in the previous graphs we now show the absolute numbers right so latency is now in milliseconds uh, and ram usage in, in, in kilobytes uh, and we show in blue our results and in orange uh, tensorflow light for microcontrollers okay um so now you might say, okay, but as you saw in the graphs, not all the uh, savings are always uh, as big. It depends, it's highly dependent on your model. So that's why we thought it would be good to, to, um, to showcase this to the public. 
So that's why we came up with a, a public benchmarking service where you can actually try your own models. And it looks like this. So there's a web page where you can upload your T of light files. And these T of light files are the, the common uh, uh, TensorFlow light uh, format um, that you can upload there. And actually, any model that runs with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers uh, is supported by Plumerize Inference Engine as well. So you, you, can, you can just upload your, your int A to quantize models there. Then after you've uploaded it, it will run in our lab on some of our microcontrollers, and it will run with, um, with our inference engine, but also with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers for comparison. And then when that is done, you will receive an email with, well, basically what I showed in the graphs uh, before. You will get latency and RAM numbers for your own model uh, with our inference engine and with TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Um, and here we don't measure or test accuracy or something like that. So you can just upload untrained models if your, your weights are maybe uh, sensitive uh, information. And we do test here on an M7 and an M4 uh, device, uh, but actually our inference engine also works on, on M0 plus or on other, uh, which sh I showed Cortex-A also in the beginning. And we test on an ST board, but actually we also internally work with, with boards from NXP, Infineon, TI, Renesis and, and others. Um, so here's the URL, plumerar.com slash benchmark. Um, and maybe it's actually a good idea to try it out right now. So I'll click on the link. Um, and we'll go to our website. Uh, and here's the form. I'll upload the file. Um, and I'll choose one from the uh, MLPerf Tiny benchmark su suite, which is the uh, Visual Wake Watch model. I'll enter my details. So there's my name. I work at Plumerai. And there's my email address. And I'll submit this. And if all goes well, this is now uh, will be running on our lab on these uh, on these microcontrollers. And as it says here, benchmarking takes three to thirty minutes. Uh, of course, it depends a, lo a lot on how many of you submit a model uh, at the same time, because we don't have hundreds of these microcontrollers uh, ready. Uh, it also slightly depends a bit on on how big your uh, actual model is. Um, so it's maybe good to go back to the slides right now and, and, and see if, if, um, if I get an email uh, uh, later on. So I'll open the slides again. Um, it's maybe also a good moment if there are any questions in between to answer them. Yes, sorry, th th that's great. Uh, there we have a bunch of questions actually. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the questions by... Uh, uh, the audience is in the in the slides that you shown before uh, about the uh, RAM or latency speed ups. Uh, in the models that Plumerai Inference Engine did not perform well. Could you please elaborate on what you perceive are the reasons? Like, is there some kind of layer in that network or uh, some some something specific in the architecture? Yeah, thank you. That's uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so there were some uh, models in which we uh, use slightly more uh, RAM compared to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers, but we do perform better in latency. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a trade-off that we decided to make in a particular way. So we consume a bit extra RAM at a, uh, to get much better latency. So this is a knob that we can tune internally, actually. Uh, and we can we can change that depending on their requirements, right? For some device, uh, some application, the RAM <coughs> usage numbers might not be that important, or the latency numbers might not be important, and we can internally tune this. Got it. So uh, when we use this website to drag and drop a model, it uses a particular setting of the trade-off that you have you know, specified a sweet spot there. But uh, I imagine then later you may be able to provide that knob for the user to change. Uh, okay, that's great. Yes, that's great. indeed. So if you're uh, interested in using our inference engine, of course, we can, uh, we can see how we can make it fit your actual uh, purpose. Yeah. Got it. That's great. Uh, one of the questions is what happens to the models once processed on your server? I guess the question is regarding 
know, whether it's a proprietary model or not. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's also a good question. So there's a, a, a I don't think I don't know if you can see it, but here on the on the bottom of the slide, so on the website itself, it's explained that we don't we will not reuse reverse engineer or steal your model, um, but we do store it because we uh, we want to be able to rerun it again uh, in case uh, something failed or in case uh, we get updated uh inference engine later on and we might want to reevaluate those models to to be able to get better uh you can you can see all the details in the privacy policy there that is linked um and if you don't agree with this uh you can always send us an email and we can we can uh, we can see what we can do for you there's another question about the memory limits for the models to be benchmarked i think uh you, you did have on the page that it is two megabytes or less right um, yes, yeah, so there are some requirements there. Um, these are just requirements because of the boards that we test on, right? Uh, our boards have certain limitations on the, the amount of RAM and the um, uh, flash size that we have. So there are limitations indeed, but that's not a limitation of the inference engine, but just of this public benchmarking service. You can always try to cut your model in half or something if it's really a big one, or you can contact us and maybe we can try to put another board there and run it there. I see. OK, that's great. Uh, uh, one last question I'll ask now, and then I'll give you back uh, you know, the talk. But uh, are similar gains to be expected when running on the recent ARM MCUs, like Codex M55 with MVE extensions? Um, that's another good question. To be honest, I don't know the answer there because I haven't uh, tested that myself. Uh, we can try to answer this question offline uh, for you. Uh, Great. Uh, we have a bunch of more questions, but I'll let you get back to the talk and we'll reserve them for the later in the session. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit now about um, what we did to get to this uh, efficient um, inference engine. And there are two main things that I want to talk about. Um, and the first one is better memory planning. And the second one is optimized and model specific code for the targets, uh, target platforms. And memory planning, uh, let me uh, refresh you a little bit. It's about placing these activations and weights somewhere in memory. And if you do it in a naive way, you just give each activation and weight their own memory region, such that you're sure they never overlap, so you get correct results. Uh, but you do use a lot of RAM. But if you look at the graph on the left, you can see that after you executed the first layer, you no longer need the first input of the first layer anymore, right? So you can use that same memory region to store something else. And that is what this memory planning is about. So uh, I'll start with uh, explaining that in a bit more detail and then afterwards get back to this optimized code. So the memory planning, um, I would like to, uh, I like to see this as a game of Tetris, um, a rotated game of Tetris to be more precise. And um, I grew up in the 90s, so that means I, I'd like to play Tetris on a, on a Game Boy. Um, and actually, if you look closely, it, it's a very good fit because it can do matrix dot products, it seems, which is exactly what you need to do uh, convolutions. So maybe we should try to port our inference engine to the Game Boy. Um, anyway, um, so this game of Tetris um, rotated, as I said. So here on the right, I rotated the screen. And normally in Tetris, uh, blocks come in from the top and they fall to the bottom. So here, uh, blocks come in from the right side uh, and they fall towards the left. And um, that is because I put RAM size on the x-axis here on top. Um, and um, the goal is the same as, as, uh, as normally in, in Tetris, is to use as little RAM as possible. So to not go beyond your RAM size, right? So normally in Tetris, if you fill the screen, it's game over. Here it's the same. It won't fit anymore on your device. Then on the Y axis, there's time. And time typically in, in, in such a situation, you measure in 
in layer execution order, right? You might execute the convolution layer first and then a pooling layer and then another convolution and so on. So that is what is on the y-axis. And then all these blocks, these individual blocks, are tensors, activations or weights of your neural network. And they have a certain shape, which is all given based on how you designed your neural network. So at the point of memory planning, these shapes are known and, and fixed, and you can't change them anymore. So to make this a little bit more concrete, um, let's try to play this game of Tetris um, with an example neural network. So for the purpose of the presentation, I came up with this network here on the left. And this network has uh, a few layers in dark blue. And these layers, <clears throat> they produce, uh, they consume input tensors, uh, activations, and they produce output activations. Um, and I gave them different colors. Now, um, in practice, you would also need to plan your weights. Uh, but for the purpose of the presentation, I thought it's, it's a bit simpler um, if, if we leave that out, but uh, the ID remains the same. Now, on the right side is still my Tetris screen, but I've put, you might not have noticed, I've put uh, white lines there. And that is, uh, that way I divide it in six rows and that matches the amount of layers that I execute. So on the right hand side, you see these different layers, Con two convolution layers, um, there's a depth wise add layers and a dense layer in the end. You might have also noticed that I put 640 here and that is the amount of RAM I have available on my example device. Um, so let's start to play this game. And um, the way I will play this game for now is to put things as much as possible to the left as they come in. So the first block comes in from the right side and I move it all the way to the left. And this block A <clears throat> has a certain height and the height is one row. And that is because it's used only as the input of the first layer. So it only needs to be kept alive during this first convolution. Now it also has a certain width. Uh, but that is beyond my control. And this example apparently has this width uh, that is just based by the, your input dimensions times the number of channels and so on, right? So it has a certain width. Now the next block comes in, block B also has a certain width, uh, apparently a lot thinner than the previous one. Um, and I also put it as much as possible to the left. And this one is actually four rows tall. And that is because if you look at the network architecture, there's some skip connection here from, uh, from this output all the way to this addition. So this activation B needs to be kept alive during four rows for four layer uh, activations. So it's, uh, um, that, that is why this, uh, it has this shape. Now next block is block C, it also comes in. Uh, it also is part of a skip connection. So also needs to be kept alive for a long time. Um, but if I play this game nicely, I can maneuver it around block B and put it all the way there on the left, uh, left side. Um, now the next block comes in. Uh, in this case, it's block E, uh, because these blocks could in theory come in in any order that I, I wish. Uh, and I decided block E comes in first. And again, I put it all the way to the left. Uh, and then block D comes in. I can't fit it anymore in this empty black space here because uh, it's, it's too wide. Um, so I put it here. And then finally block F and G come in. And now block G is too wide. Um, apparently that's how the network is designed um, to fit there. Um, so I do fit it all the way on the right. Uh, but it doesn't fit in my, in my Tetris screen. So it's, in, in this case, it's game over. It doesn't fit on my device anymore. My memory requirement is larger than the amount of RAM I have available. So this is how you play uh, Tetris, uh, but you might say, well, this is not an optimal way of playing the game. You might've seen there's, there's different decisions I could have made. I could have put blocks in, in uh, as they come in in a different order, I, or I could have used a different heuristic of uh, not always putting things to the left. So let's try again. Um, 
and play the game again. And this time I will use the same heuristic. I will still always put blocks as much as possible to the left, but um, I decide to, do, to put them in, in a different order. So let's say block B and F come in first. I put them there on the left. Then A, C, and G come in. Also move them as much as possible to the left. Um, and then D and E come in. And this is actually everything. All the blocks are there. They still have the same shapes, sizes as before. But my memory requirement is now only 500 kilobytes. So in this example, I managed to play the game of Tetris a lot better. And this, this game is played by all these inference engines. So TensorFlow Lite from microcontrollers does play this game. It uses a certain heuristic and a certain uh, input order in which these blocks come in. Um, and our inference engine also plays this game. And uh, it does that uh, in, a, in a smarter way than TensorFlow Lite from microcontrollers. But you, you can maybe imagine that uh, playing this game is not so easy because these neural network architectures are always different. The shapes are different, the, the connections are different, um, and actually playing this game uh, is an MP hard problem. So it's not that uh, that trivial to to come up with a, with an optimal solution. Now there's one thing extra that we do to get even better um, uh, RAM usage. Uh, and that is what we call lower granularity planning. So originally I divided my uh, screen in six rows, but you could imagine uh, that if you divide it even further, you can change the shapes of the blocks. So let's pick this add layer over here and say that it's implemented in such a way internally that you first do take half of the input, add it with, with the other, uh, part of the input um, and produce half of the output. And if you do that, it means that sort of halfway your add operation, you no longer need the first half of your input D. So what you then get is you get some kind of small gap there in your, your, your tensor D. And you can, in this, this case, we did not gain any memory, uh, but you can do the same for the output of the add layer. Right? You can say, okay, uh, during the first half of the execution of this uh, add layer, we don't need to have the full output tensor ready, just half of it. And if you do that, then actually they fit nicely together like this, and your memory uh, requirement is now changed. So now you need only 450 kilobytes uh, as, as an example, uh, and you have even more room to grow your model or fit other applications on your device. So in summary for memory planning, these are the two main things that we do. We, we play this game of Tetris in a, in a smarter way. Um, and we uh, go to this lower uh, granularity of planning to save even more uh, RAM. Now again, of course, it's highly dependent on the kind of models that you run on uh, how well this performs. So the second thing that I want to uh, highlight is uh, the way we get better speeds. And there are two parts to this. And the first one, which I explained on this slide, is the optimized 8-bit uh, integer code. And here again, we have this example graph on the left. And for each of those layer types, we need to provide a function that implements that efficiently. So for example, this conf2d function is one that's, that's used a lot. Um, and because of that, we provide optimized conf2d code, which is implemented using this uh, im 2 call and generalized matrix multiplication, or GEM uh, algorithm, to get uh, to uh, really efficient, uh, efficient code. But we don't stop at just optimizing those most common layers. We do that also for less common layers um, because they start to get in, uh, important as well if you optimize the, uh, the others as well. So for example, for the additions, we also provide optimized code and for many, many more kinds of layers. Now we can go one step beyond this and say, well, we don't just have a conf2d function but we actually can also have a conf 2 d one by one function, which is quite common to have uh, 2D convolutions with one by one filters. 
Um, so we can have dedicated function for that, and that might use a slightly different algorithm to compute uh, the convolution, which might become more efficient. Now on this slide, I mentioned uh, optimized code quite a lot. Uh, so maybe it's good to explain a little bit what that means. So of course you can optimize at the algorithmic level, right? Like into call and gem and so on. But um, we all also optimize at a much lower level. So here I will um, uh, mention a few of the example code optimizations. Um, so what we do have is handwritten assembly if needed, right? When the compiler doesn't uh, produce the code that we uh, wanted to. Secondly, we specialize for the target hardware, right? For example, for the M4 and M7, we read the documentation, we look at each of the kinds of available instructions, uh, how many cycles do, do each instruction take? Is there a dual issue or not? Uh, what is the cache system? Um, uh, all these kinds of things. Then we also do um, register count aware optimizations, which means that some optimizations in theory might make sense, but then in practice you see, oh, we only have 12 registers available. So it's, it will lead to register spilling. So rather not do that particular optimization. Um, and we also do template based loop on rolling. Um, but we also do things like uh, pre-processing of some of the data, right? If you pre-process your weights once, um, you might get different memory access patterns and those might benefit uh, execution of your code later on. So I mentioned uh, we do other things as well. Uh, so this is uh, partly uh, what leads to um, this efficient um, inference engine, uh, but we also do this thing called model specific uh, inference. So let me explain that in this slide. So on the left, you see the model agnostic approach. So here you have some optimized code functions, uh, as I show in the previous slide, and you have some interpreter and you compile them together. Um, and then you run that on device together with your model data, right? Your model data says, well, I have these layers of these configuration with these filters and so on, and you run that together, but you don't compile in the model data in your, well, Technically, it might be there still in the binary, uh, but your, your binary is still able to execute any kind of model that you provide because it has this interpreter that is generic. Um, and this is the approach that TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers uses. Now we take this model specific approach. In this case, you don't have an interpreter anymore, but you take your model data and your graph, your configuration, together with the optimized code. And you tell the compiler, hey, please optimize this for me. And you run that on your device. And we are not the only one doing this. For example, micro TVM also uh, uses this approach. Now this might still be a little bit high level. Um, so I have a, in the next slide, I'll explain a little bit uh, what this means uh, in practice through a small example. So here on the left, you see some C++ code and on the right, compiled assembly. Um, on the left, uh, I wrote some example function that is relatively uh, simple, just as a for loop over the number of channels of your activations uh, and it multiplies by 16. Now on the right, you have the compiled assembly and I don't expect you to, to, to read, read uh, everything here, but maybe what you can see is that there's some loop structure here. There's a branch to some label L3 and that label is there. So this is the loop uh, in yellow. You can also see the inner body part, uh, which is executed multiple times. And this is generic code because it will run with any number of channels. Now, if you, take this uh, model specific approach and you tell the compiler, hey, this is my model graph. Um, it might see that your number of channels has a specific value. So let's say you would use RGB input data and you have three channels. So then you get code like this. So this is the, the same function as before, but the number of channels is now hard coded and replaced with three. If you put this in the compiler, you get completely different codes. Uh, in this case, the, the loop structure is no longer there even, but even if it would be, um, it will result in different code that might uh, be more optimized. 
so that illustrates a little bit uh, uh, with some uh, toy example what this model specific approach can can bring you so if you combine that uh, the way we get better speed in our inference engine is because of these optimized functions but also because we take this model specific uh, code generation approach so ah i've got mail uh, it tells me let's see if that's correct there's my inbox and yes there is an email uh, sent 20 minutes ago so that's about when we submitted it um, and it contains the results of the model that uh, that we submitted so here you see our own inference engine uh, and you can compare it to tensorflow light for microcontrollers and indeed uh, ram numbers are uh, better and so is latency for two different devices uh, so that worked that's nice let's go back to the slides um, and actually um, uh, i've reached the, the conclusion of this presentation um, so let me give you a short recap so what we've seen is the world's fastest cortex m inference engine uh, for microcontrollers uh, i've shown a lot more benchmarks for all kinds of different models that we could find uh, and i ex explained a little bit the two main uh, factors that contribute to this right is better memory planning uh, and uh, the, the model specific compilation approach and optimized code now as i mentioned before we do a lot of other things at plumerize or if you're interested in any of these other topics then do also contact us right not just the int8 inference engine but also our binarized neural networks uh, our person detection application uh, our own ip core that runs on fpgas uh, and as i said before it's the entire stack that that we cover so we can also provide uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, complete solution for you Okay, um, with that, I want to leave you uh, at this slide. So this public benchmarking service is live, as you saw in the demo. Uh, please visit it uh, to try it out with your own model. Uh, contact us if you, if you need any help or have any questions about it. Um, and of course, I'm happy to take any questions right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric. That was really great. Uh, I especially love the uh, Tetris uh, visualization that you showed for the memory planning that that really drove the point home. Uh, very nice way to present that. Uh, we actually have a bunch of questions. Uh, let me walk through as many of them as we can in the next okay. few minutes. Uh, and for the audience members, you may have a poll that pops up. Please do answer the questions if it helps us provide you with uh, you know, improve our uh, content and presentation. Uh, one of the questions is uh, any uh, fine detail look into the performance of different tuning based on the kernel size, number of filters, type of convolution, depth-wise versus dense or spatial, uh, in which uh, you, know, you have a finer detail comparison with TensorFlow TFLM. Uh, thank you for that issue. question. Um, yeah, that's, that's a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I don't have any backup slides or something like that with these numbers. Uh, of course, indeed, it depends per layers, layer configurations. For some layers, we do get much better uh, speed. For other layers, we don't. Um, here's one uh, strange suggestion. If you want to find this out yourself, you can actually construct layers with just one network, uh, one layer, uh, networks with one layer, and submit it to our uh, uh, <laughs> surface, and you will get those results. Um, if you want to get more details, I think you should, uh, you, you have to contact us uh, for that. I don't have these numbers right uh, from the top of my head, no. No, oh, that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, did you benchmark against the Glow compiler? Um, that's a good question. I've, I've seen it, um, but didn't test it. Um, I don't remember exactly why, but we, we did try, I, I did see it and we did, uh, include all the all the other inference engines that we could find and make work. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have to look that up why we didn't include that one. All right, thank you. What input data do you use? Zeros, random noise, or something else? What input data do we use in the public benchmarking service? Um, I don't know from the top of my head, but. I don't think it matters, right? These neural networks are deterministic. 
um, which means uh, that, uh, and we don't test accuracy. So for latency and RAM, it shouldn't matter what you put in, as far as I understand. Got it. Um, another question, does Plumerai replace all three tasks belonging to the inference task that you mentioned with the proprietary engine, or do you still make use of CMSS and then, and only have the own engine for the other two tasks covered by TensorFlow? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so we do provide all these different uh, tasks, but we built we do build on top of TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. So if there's any uh, exotic layer, for example, that we don't support in our inference engine, we do actually support it by falling back to uh, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Yes. Oh, that's great. Uh, another question is: uh, Is your engine compatible with full static memory allocation like PF Lite Micro? There is no malloc. Uh, yes, indeed. So the memory planning uh, doesn't use any malloc. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a yes. Great. Are you exploring different quantization parameters such as 4-bit or 2-bit? Um, so this is a question uh, I think maybe for some of my colleagues because it's not the, the, the what this talk is about, right? This talk is about 8-bit uh, eight, eight uh, integer models. Uh, and we did also work with, uh, we do also work on binarized neural networks, um, which does mean we also try um, uh, other uh, quantization in between. Uh, there's, of course, both the weights and the activations that you can change, right? So it's uh, two bits, you can do two bit weights and then maybe four bit activations or something else. Um, they all get lead to different performance on different kind of devices. Right, not all devices are good at certain bit widths. Yep, got it. Uh, while reporting peak memory usage, does the Plumera engine does it also consider the extra memory needed due to IMTOCALL operation? Yes. So here we we do include all those uh, anything that is uh, needed um, uh, there. It's, this is not not just even the tensors. Uh, not uh, so it also includes the temporary tensors. It also includes any other objects that we put in the RAM uh, at runtime. So it really contains the whole thing. If it says uh, uh, maybe not the stack usage, so it's maybe like one kilobyte or so you, or two that you have to add, but then you might have to add that as well to TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Um, Got it. Okay, the next question is, does your benchmark of 50 models use model agnostic or model specific optimizations? Sorry, does the the benchmarking surface? Uh, the fifty models that you showed the bar chart for. Yeah. The, do you get those numbers with model agnostic or model specific optimizations or both? Uh, so that that uses our own inference stack, which means it uses the model specific optimizations, right? So in, for every run, uh, the compiler optimizes the code for that specific model that is being run at that moment. Yes. Got it. All right, can your inference engine run on any of the RISC-V cores? If so, do you have any benchmarking data? Um, I don't have any benchmarking data. Um, this is also maybe a question for for uh, for one of my colleagues. Maybe maybe you can send us an email if you're interested in uh, RISC-V uh, because we, we did also experiment with that indeed. Got it. And, and just a reminder for uh, audience and uh, Plumerai uh, members who are on the call, uh, we will continue, we can continue this, uh, all these questions on the TinyML forums. So I know, uh, I think Cedric and the rest of his team can be, uh, can spend some time to answer the questions at the forums, that'd be really great. Okay, and the last question I have here is, uh, would you consider running these models in the future on AWS ARM Cortex virtual MCUs? to provide elastic scaling of the service for people wanting to compare their models for inference performance? Yeah, that's a good, uh, good suggestion. Um, I myself didn't know that was available, but uh, uh, yeah, that's maybe a possibility if it's, if it's indeed needed, yeah. Great, all right. Now that's all the questions we have. I mean, uh, yeah, we have a lot of interesting questions. And yeah, thank you so much for the great presentation. I really, once again, really love the Tetris visualization. And uh, thank you. yeah, it makes sense. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, we can move through the remaining slides. I'm just gonna request remote control again. 
Yeah, and just a reminder again to the audience members, please do continue the conversation at tinyml.org slash forums. Thanks again to our TinyML Talk strategic partners, ARM, the Software and Hardware Foundation for TinyML. DeepLight uses AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Edge Impulse enables developers to create the next generation of intelligent device solutions with embedded machine learning. EMSA Visual Sense, the I in IoT with Edge AI visual sensors. Greenwaves Technologies, enabling the next generation of sensor and carable products to process rich data with energy efficiency. Gravity Inc, software development services for TinyML solutions. HOTG, HOTG is building the distributed infrastructure to pave the way for AI enabled edge applications. Latent AI, adaptive AI for the intelligent edge. Maxim integrated with the new Max 78000 implements AI inferences at low energy levels, enabling complex audio and video inferencing to run on small batteries. Kixo AutoML, automated machine learning platform that builds TinyML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Qualcomm AI Research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. Reality AI, add advanced sensing to your product with Edge AI at TinyML. Renaissance, broad and scalable edge comp computing portfolio. Seed Studio, the IoT hardware enabler. Sensimal, enabling the creation of production grade smart sensor devices. Synsense, build sensing and inference hardware for ultra low power embedded mobile and edge devices. Sentient, moving artificial intelligence and machine learning from the cloud to the edge devices. Thank you again to all our sponsors. Uh, just a reminder for the next animal talk on uh, Tuesday, January 11th. Thank you very much everyone for attending today. Have a happy new year. And thanks once again to our speaker, Cedric Nukter and Plumerai.